Greetings, everyone. It's again a great pleasure to welcome back to our YouTube channel, Dr. Feder Luri, uh, who has appeared here before, and he is emerging as the, the young giant in compression. And uh, he started his career as an academic vascular surgeon in Russia, and then he moved to the University of Hawaii. And then after that, and now he, become, he is the associate uh, Vice President of the Jobs Vascular Institute and an adjunct research professor at the section of vascular surgery in the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, which is a famous place for those of you who don't realize that because for one thing that uh, uh, Dr. Laser Greenfield, who invented the vena cava filter, was chief of, of vascular surgery there. And now Thomas Wakefield, who's another legendary figure, uh, 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 succeeded him. In, in any event, uh, Feder Lurie also serves as a director of the American Board of Venous and Lymphatic Medicine, director of the Vein Center Accreditation Board of the Intersidal uh, Accreditation Committee, and member of the Medicare Evidence Development and Coverage Advisory Committee of the CMS. And that's really important because that gives him the ability to provide good scientific data to influence CMS about stockings and compression devices and the like. He's past president of the American Venus Forum and the American Venus Forum Foundation and member of several committees uh, for the Society of Vascular Surgery. He's an honorary member of the European Venus Forum and several European vascular surgical societies. He served as a principal investigator, get this, on 18 multi-center clinical trials. He's published over 200 papers, 17 book chapters, and 250 presentations. Uh, again, it's a real pleasure, and I thank you for coming to talk to our audience on this YouTube channel. I'm sure everyone is going to love it. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Caprini, for your kind introduction, and, uh, and thank you for inviting me to this. I will start sharing my screen now uh, so you can uh, uh, see my slides. Uh, Dr. Caprini asked me to, uh, uh, to do this talk, which uh, I, in part I did on another meeting, and uh, the whole issue here is there's a lot of data around, but which publication, which papers the practitioners and the patients should know? That's a good question. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest with that. I like this slide from the informational science because what it tells us, it's not data uh, that's important. It's, it's a process and information interpretation that's important. And it's, as I said, it's a lot of data. There's some of this data deserve to be put in a storage box and uh, some of them deserve to be forgotten and some of them deserve to be uh, used later on and how to separate those especially when it comes to compression therapy, is a really good question. And uh, the good example uh, is probably one of the best uh, methodologically uh, trials in the compression therapy that we recently have, which is a SOX trial. Now, the reason why it's become important, because other than being the largest and, again, methodologically very good study, it was a basis for the recommendation of the major guidelines. So you can see in 2016, just guidelines based just on that trial suggested not using compression stockings uh, after uh, acute DVT, but they make the comment that patient with acute symptoms uh, still deserve some use of stockings initially. This is very interesting uh, because on the one uh, side, they say, well, patients shouldn't use uh, compression stockings, but specifically only to prevent DVT. But on the other side, they say, well, but the stockings actually do help with the symptoms, so patients should be using them. So why such controversial statement? Well, the trial, if you look at this, has substantial limitation. I just uh, want to address one of those, so there are many others, and that is what they use. They compare uh, the uh, 30 to 40 millimeters mercury stockings, the prescription stockings that most of the people prescribe for this, with so-called placebo. And placebo is supposed to be nothing. It's supposed to be in the pharmaceutical trial, just a sugar pill that has no effect. 
but the actual placebo in this trial was tokens with the five millimeters mercury compression at the ankle. And just looking at this picture, you can see that in order to have this five millimeters, you actually need to have seven to eight millimeters mercury pressure in the calf. Otherwise, the stockings will just fall down and would not hold on the leg. So actual placebo in this trial was low pressure anti-graduated stockings. And this is when uh, uh, I think it's appropriate to tell everybody, especially those practitioners who uh, you, you treat those patients that they should know a couple of studies that has been done. Many of them will be done, but I just pick up two that most illustrative. You can see the graph on the left side on the screen that shows that stockings do have effect on swelling, but you see there is virtually no difference between eight millimeter stockings and 20 millimeter stockings and very little difference with the 30 to 40 millimeter stockings. So the pressure, low pressure does work at least for swelling. And the second uh, graph from Giovanni Mosti and Hugo Parch paper showed us that anti-graduation stockings, the stockings where the pressure is high in the calf and low in the ankle also decrease swelling substantially. And remember the swelling is one of the major signs uh, in uh, acute DVT and the transition to post-thrombotic syndrome. And it's a major complaint in many patients. And so this is very important component. So just based on this uh, data alone, we can definitely say that the conclusion of the SOX trials uh, were not correct well, the right conclusion would be that low pressure in anti-graduating stockings work the same way as a high pressure in patients with acute DVT as they transition to post-thrombotic process. Uh, so this one of these things, and, and of course, over time, people realize that the stock, uh, SOX trial has many limitations, but here is an interesting thing. This is the most recent CHESS guidelines published just this year. And this, again, it's a single trial that they refer to. The rest of the trials pretty much show the effect of stockings is substantial. And they again recommend against the stocking, but it's, they went even further. They say, however, it doesn't mean the gradation compression stockings will not reduce acute symptoms of DVT. And then they added all chronic symptoms in those who develop post-thrombotic syndrome. Now we have this contradiction statement when one say they say don't use them, on the other say they say well, but if the patient has symptoms, either acute or chronic, you should use them. Well, so basically they're uh, defeating their own thesis uh, of uh, not using stockings. But again, the uh, the data is solely based on just one trial, and we should be know and aware of those. Now the question then becomes, which pressure should we use? And here is the consensus statement. It's not a, a randomized trial, but it reflects what experts around the world uh, believe is uh, data we have or we don't have. And if you look at the uh, first author, it's Hugo Parge, the giant in, in, in a compression therapy, the person who knows everything on every single publication on compression. So after looking at all the publication, they concluded that we really don't know which pressure to use in, uh, in patients with varicose veins. We don't really know which is the best pressure to use in swelling, whether it's venous swelling or lymphedema, but we do know that in patients with venous ulcers, we need to use the high pressure 30 to 40 millimeters mercury. So question is, how do we know that we deliver that pressure of 30 to 40? And there's another piece of information that everybody should know, multiple studies. I just uh, put two of those uh, that more uh, clearly illustrate in, uh, the point that when you use stockings out of the box, uh, you really don't know which pressure they apply. You can uh, guess in the majority of patients, it will be probably correct pressure, but in some substantial percentage of patients, the actual pressure will not be what's indicated on the box. So this is stockings, but the same is true for compression bandages. When we did the study years ago, uh, it asking 
uh, very experienced wound care nurses who put bandages on their legs every single day, multiple times, to do this with the control settings when we put a pressure sensor. And you can see on the graph that only one third of the bandages actually was in the range that we want. And the rest of them were either higher pressure or lower pressure, which is very important. And I'll come back to this point that higher pressure sometimes is not what we want. More, this is another piece of data that I think everybody should know is that the bandages don't stay with the same pressure all the time. The pressure decreases and it decreases at different time for different bandages. So we apply the bandage. We don't really know what pressure we do unless we measure that. We also don't know what pressure going to be five, seven days later, again, unless we measure those pressures. And we, in routine practice today, we still don't do this. We don't measure the pressures. Well, this is a very interesting study that I should, everybody should know. And what it shows is, yes, all bandages lose pressure over time. But here's an interesting thing. Those bandages don't. And those bandages are adaptive bandages, Velcro devices, that patient can adapt themselves. And Hugo Parch in another study showed that if patients are allowed to put these bandages and under the pressure, they actually do a better job than the nurses. You see this graph here, and on the left side is a patient, on the right side is nurses. You see that the patients are more consistent in the pressure. But if you also look at the numbers, you'll see that they don't really apply lower pressure. They apply exactly the pressure that they were uh, instructed to do the first time they had this application. So they feel that. They know what the pressure apply. And if we give it to the patient, they're probably going to do a much better job with this adjustment. Now, talking about high pressure. This is what we really all uh, try to avoid. Those mixed ulcers, whether diabetic ulcers or ulcers in patients who have both venous and peripheral arterial disease, uh, the many practitioners believe that we should not use compression in this patient. Here's the papers that everybody should know. Uh, I came in for the same authors, this Giovanni Mosti and Hugo Parch did a fantastic job looking specifically what happened in those patients and what they beautifully demonstrated that if the pressure apply correctly in the patients with peripheral arterial disease, not only doesn't cause the ischemia, it actually improve saturation, oxygen saturation of the tissue, improve uh, oxygen delivery to the tissue. But the key here is to apply the correct pressure because again, it should be very carefully uh, measured and it should not exceed uh, the perfusion pressure. Otherwise you really get in trouble. Now, important part that again, the paper and the study that every should know is that the pressure that we applied on the surface of the leg is lower than the pressure that happens inside the leg. This is Jean-Francois Hull's paper that measured both pressure on the leg itself and inside the leg in the muscular compartment. And what they show is that the pressure in the muscular compartment is always slightly higher than on the surface. Here is, for example, if we apply the pressure of 40 millimeters mercury, then the pressure inside the department is 70. So again, we should uh, not be scared to apply compression in the patients with mixed ulcers, but we should know what we're doing. So, and there are some devices now that are commercially available and are not very expensive that everybody can get uh, in a wound care and other places that use bandages and stockings and actually measure that pressure and know what we are doing. So in the conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I think that what um, we all should know and pay attention to is the details of those trials. And it's clearly show that SOX trial, although it's a good methodologically, has a lot of flaws and should not change our practice. Now we know that lower pressure may be sufficient for some patients, not all the patients, but some patients can uh, benefit from lower than uh, pressure that we usually use. And the patient themselves can effectively manage that if we give them the right device and instruct them to do the right things. 
And of course, the plus one is the compression in the mix also. It's a big controversial issue, but we can and should use compression in these patients. We just need to use it appropriately. Well, thank you very much for listening to this and uh, I will be happy to address any question from either uh, Dr. Caprini or the audience. Uh, and I'm gonna stop sharing my slides. Uh, Dr. Caprini, you're muted. Thank you very much. <laughs> that was a brilliant lecture. And, and the reason why I say that is it's taken the traditional concepts that have been proven by these giants, Hugo Parsh and Giovanni Mosti, and translated them into everyday language. And for, I would say is for our patients that are watching this, the takeaway is for most of you, you really need to wear stockings if you have a blood clot It'll help with your symptoms, and it'll also probably prevent uh, long-term complications. You should wear those stockings as, uh, uh, on a long-term basis because like a patient said, well, how long do I have to wear these stockings? Well, only as long as you want your um, uh, swelling to stay away. So you have to keep doing this. Now, the other thing that I would say is there uh, are patients better that, that can't uh, wear the stockings and my question for you is, uh, what do you do about them? And maybe as a, uh, that's a segue into why in the world do I have a giraffe looking at us in the background? Yeah, well, uh, I, I think Dr. Caprini, you probably can answer that last question better than I do, but uh, it's an it's a, a interesting uh, uh, observation from the, done by uh, Mr. Shaw a long time ago. Uh, when he looked at the giraffes and realized that uh, it's with the height that this animal has, the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure in the veins and the leg of the giraffe should be very, very high. So why the giraffe do not develop venous disease? And the answer was because the skin in the leg of the giraffe is different. It is very stiff. It doesn't allow swelling. It doesn't, it contains the pressure. And based on that uh, observation, uh, he developed the first Velcro device, uh, which was a circuit at this time. Right now, Medi company has uh, this technology and there are several uh, devices in other companies that use the same principle, applying the uh, very stiff material, uh, low stretch material, uh, but with the Velcro. Well, this is an interesting thing because you know, we have this short stretch bandages, but in order to apply those, you really have to be an expert. You have to know how to do that. It's not an easy thing. So you have to be trained uh, and you have to do this right. With the Velcro devices, you can be much more flexible. Even patients can do it. It means you can apply certain pressure and then patients can adjust it. And when the swelling goes down, you have to increase the pressure of the device is getting loose. The patient can adjust it, maintaining the same pressure. At the same time, on the other hand, when the swelling increases, uh, the bandages may become uncomfortable. That's why people don't like them sometimes. So you, again, you can adjust that. So I think that um, this is actually one of the best compression options that I know about. Uh, again, giving the patient an opportunity to adjust uh, the pressure to the level when they feel comfortable and it still help is much better than uh, just cut this bandage and, and uh, you know, and forget about it. Yeah, that's right. And, and so I, I just wanted to point out to our audience that if you're if you're having trouble with stockings, but you need them and your, your doctor tells you that, well, I don't know what to do with that. Uh, you need to see someone like a, a Dr. Lurie, who's an expert in this, and uh, can, can advise you to using the Velcro devices, which are very simple strap devices that people can use. So I'd like to thank you very much, Feder, for your wonderful talk. And I would uh, uh, tell the audience that you can visit my uh, uh, website, either www.venusdisease.com or capriniriscore.org. And you can ask a question on that site. And you, if you ask any questions, I will direct them to Dr. Lurie and he will be happy to answer them. So again, thank you very much, Feder, and uh, stay safe, uh, have a great day. And I look forward 
to our next interaction. And I can't wait to see your next presentation because I wanna put it on YouTube uh, as soon as possible. Your, your information is absolutely vital, especially for the patients out there. And especially when you see, as you go through this controversy between the guidelines and actual clinical practice. And I think we have to make sure that we have a combination of both and you bring that to the, to the table very, very nicely. Thank you very much, Feder, and have a great day. Thank you, Dr. Caprini, and, uh, and thank you very much for this series of very educational, very useful videos that I enjoy watching on YouTube myself. I don't know about other people. Thank you so much. Thank you.